Good morning, everyone. What a beautiful day. It is so great to be here. Uh, I love being up here at Yesler Terrace because this is such a great symbol of who we are as a city. This wonderful, beautiful place in our city, a place where our former governor and secretary of commerce spent much of his youth in Yesler Terrace, where we built housing for people, where we have the great park and recreation center where market and middle class and low income live and work together and care about their community. And that's why we're here today, again, is to say that we will stand up for Seattle's values. We will make sure that fair wages and protecting workers is at the center of our policies. We know that we are living in a time that is one of the most disruptive economic, economic times in our country's history. It is probably one of the most disruptive times since the Industrial Revolution. Our economy is changing so rapidly, and with it, those long-term jobs that have consistent wages and benefits are disappearing with them, and the gig economy is on the rise. In this rapidly changing economy, we need to make sure that we work for economic justice, that we make sure that our workers have those hard fart protections that we've fought for for generations. There is no doubt that the explosive growth of companies like Lyft and Uber has helped enrich many and has helped create opportunity for communities throughout our region. But there are some facts that are absolutely clear as well. Many Uber and Lyft drivers are not receiving fair compensation, especially after they have to pay the extent expenses associated with doing the work. And second, the explosive growth of Uber and Lyft has had a significant impact on Seattle congestion. Over the past decade, we have been the fastest growing city in the country, and the growth has brought it with, with it incredible innovations and jobs. But it's also brought some significant challenges. Average rents in Seattle have increased by 44%, 44%. The median home sale price in Seattle in six years has increased 86%. But workers' wages have barely budged. More and more workers, like our nurses, our construction workers, our teachers, can't afford to live in Seattle. And it's no secret that our traffic congestion is some of the worst in the country. We know that Uber and Lyft brings with it many benefits and values. People rely on that to get that last mile. Many people don't own a car so they can use Uber and Lyft but it also contributes to the congestion in the city of Seattle. It slows our buses and, and creates congestion, not just in our streets, but at our valuable curb space. Last year alone, Uber and Lyft rides, starting or ending in the city of Seattle, 24 million, 24 million rides. We know the impacts of that volume of traffic on the city of Seattle. We found that one study the University of Washington did recently said that during the peak times, Uber and Lyft vehicles picking up and dropping off in South Lake Union accounted for one third of the traffic volume. Anyone who's tried to get through Mercer knows what that means. Of course, we also know that Uber and Lyft drivers are an important part of our communities and our economy. But despite their hard work and their contributions, many of them are not making a living wage. That's because most gig workers, like these drivers, aren't subject to our city's requirement that large employers pay a $16 minimum wage. On top of that, we don't get standard benefits that many workers have, like workers' compensation, sick leave, unemployment insurance, even the payroll tax portion. That's not good enough for Seattle. When we have this many workers working hard to make our city a better place, who are using driving to support their families and their hopes and dreams for the next generation, they need to be treated fairly. From our $15 fight for minimum wage to our domestic worker bill of rights, we have always been that city that understands the success of our city and the success of any company relies on treating workers fairly. That's why today we are announcing our fair share plan to invest in workers, transit, 
and affordable housing. And can I just say that streetcar ding was right on cue. <laughs> this proposal is ensuring that Seattle continues to build on its legacy of fighting for workers and economic justice. And it's in a growing city to make sure that the people who actually work in Seattle can afford to live in Seattle. We have to make sure that this great economy works for more people. Right now, Uber and Lyft only pay their drivers for a portion of the time they're in their cars working. If you think about it, there's about three periods. There's when they've got the driver in the car, when they've accepted the ride or going to get the driver, and when they're waiting for the driver. Only a fraction of that time, the time when the people are actually in the car is being compensated. That means they're not paying for all the other times that they are actually working for and benefiting those billion dollar corporations. And on top of that, they don't provide critical benefits like sick and safe time, meal or rest breaks, unemployment insurance, or any time off if there's a family crisis. My fair share plan will mandate that drivers be paid a minimum wage and have access to critical benefits and expenses. Under our fair share plan, drivers will be paid for their time with a passenger and time spent driving to pick up the passenger and expenses. We will work to make sure they have access to critical benefits that other workers have. Right now, Uber and Lyft have declared, have declined to share their data with us. That's one reason why we're commissioning a study to determine what the exact right amount is for both wages and reasonable expenses. We've been working with the companies. I'm optimistic they will bring their information to the table. I'm very optimistic that their public stand on this has been at least on part of it that they support a real minimum wage and reasonable expenses. In order to implement this landmark worker protection, we will need the data from the companies and from drivers. Having the driver voice in this is critical. I have been having the great fortune over the last several weeks to meet with drivers in different ways and to have a round table and hear their stories. I know what we're doing is the right thing to do. In addition to this, we will make sure that as we grow as a city, we will put an additional 50 cent tax on Uber and Lyft rides. Our studies and our data shows that will have no impact on the number of rides people take or on the money that goes in the pocket of drivers. But what it will allow us to do is make sure we have better transportation infrastructure for that city of the future and make sure that we have housing right in our city so people can walk to work, ride to work, roll to work. A growing city needs to make sure that people can actually afford to live in that city. One day, there'll be Uber and Lyft drivers who can say that they stand with workers because they have been treated fairly. We know also that we have to have a better way because this is people's lifeblood, that if the companies have the sole right to kick people off the platform and deny them their source of wages, that has to be fair. So we will also be creating a dispute resolution center that gives those drivers a way to have representation and an independent forum to challenge the deactivation of drivers. In the end, we'll be able to invest with a 51 cent tax. We will have 52 million for 500 users of housing near transit. For 51 cents, we'll also be able to make sure that Uber and Lyft drivers can get paid a fair wage. And our fair share plan will also create $56 million to fully fund the streetcar and make sure that we are a world-class city that deserves a world-class transportation system. We need to think big. We need to make those investments like this, not just for today and for these workers, but for their families and for their children and for the future of our city. We need it for our climate goals. Our fair share plan will make sure that this modest 51 cent tax is one that will, in the end, enrich not just the drivers and their families, but all of Seattle. I want to be clear, this is not a tax on riders. It is a tax on two billion dollar corporations that are public corporations using public laws to, to meet what they need to do as companies. When they went public, they were taking the benefits and resources of the taxpayers and American residents. 
Uber, when it went public, was valued at over $82 billion. Lyft was valued at over $28 billion. They can afford a 50 cent tax, which data shows will not decrease the number of rides, nor hurt what goes in the pocket of drivers, but will help our city and be able to deal with the impacts on our city. I want to recognize all the people standing behind me um, for all the work that they have done on this, for them standing up for fairness and justice. I really want to recognize a number of people, particularly Nicole Grant of the Martin Luther King Labor Council, Alex Hudson of Transportation Coalition Choices, Patience from the Housing Development Consortium, and finally, to thank our Uber and Lyft drivers. Their voice has been really critical through this whole thing. One reason we're having a period of time for this study is we heard from the drivers themselves they wanted to give more input to make sure that their economic realities were being recognized by the legislation, that how they do their jobs was reflected in this legislation. I want to thank them for having the patience and the courage to do that. And I also want to tell you that some of the stories I heard to me were not just heartbreaking, but they also inspired me. Inspired me to know that people every day are getting up getting in their cars and going to work and trying to support their vision of what a better city can be, their vision of what they can do for their families, to work, to feel dignity. You're going to hear from one of those people right now, Gloria Cisneros, who's a Lyft driver. She's remarkable. Um, her story is part of the inspiration for us doing this and knowing that what we're doing is about justice, it's about fairness, and it's about building a better, diverse, and more inclusive city. So Gloria, thank, thank you for you. talking. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my story. Thank you, Mayor, for that. Um, my name is Gloria Cisneros, and I was a nursing assistant, and I started driving for Uber and Lyft in 2016 as a part-time, which rapidly became my full-time job. I used to make pretty good money, not working so many hours per week, maybe 40, 45 hours per week to make a pretty decent amount of money. And over the times, now we have to drive for at least 60, 70 hours, some people even more, to be able to make not even as close as what I used to make back then. Also, uh, in 2017, I, um, I called the police because I, a driver back into my car, and he got out, he was drunk. So I called the police to report this person, not because he did damage to my car, but because he was a drunk driver on the streets, and I wanted him out, you know, so he won't hurt or kill someone. Two years later, here it is, 2019, February, I get a, a email from Uber saying that they're deactivated my account because the checker background check showed that I was in an accident at fault. So I went, I did everything I had to do. I paid to get a police report from the state Washington patrol. And it clearly stated that it was not, first of all, an accident that I called to report someone, but it shows as an accident. So I took this, I faxed it to the big people in the in uh, Uber, I took it to the office, and they still didn't do anything about it until today I'm deactivated from their account, which left me with no money to support my family, no money to pay my bills, and no money to pay for a car that I have to purchase to be able to drive for Uber and Lyft. So here I am, broke, don't know what to do. And um, I thank you guys, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to be able to tell my story and be voice to all of the many drivers we have out here in the city of Seattle. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you, Gloria. Gloria has provided over 9,000 rides to our community. She is a five-star driver 
and she deserves five-star treatment by Uber and Lyft. My name's Nicole Grant, I'm with MLK Labor, and we fight for workers' rights in Seattle. And it's undeniable that there has been an incredible benefit to our community from the growing tech industry. But it is also a fact that some of this wealth has been at workers' expense and that they have been left behind. This effort that we're working on together is a solution that will protect drivers and give them a voice and a fair wage, and it will address our most serious concerns as workers, housing and transportation. Seattle is a smart city. This is a caring city. And I'm asking all Seattleites to get on board and find solutions that work for drivers, for housing, for transportation. Thank you. Please welcome Patience Malaba from the Housing Development Consortium. Thank you. Good morning. I am excited to be here today. For the record, my name is Patience Malaba, and I am here on behalf of the Housing Development Consortium of Seattle King County. Our 180 diverse members work across King County to ensure that all people live with dignity and safe, healthy, and affordable homes within communities of opportunity. And today, our region is facing a shortfall of 156,000 affordable homes that we need to ensure that low-income and moderate-income families are not paying more than a third of their income towards housing. And that is why today we stand strong in support of the effort that the city of Seattle is about to lead on. This is truly an opportunity for our city to lead with other cities across the nation and make transformational change. It is an opportunity to ensure that our growth within a state where we have the most regressive tax structure, we are able to ensure that all people are able to thrive within our city. All people are able to benefit from the growth, from the wealth, from the success that our city has enjoyed. And how do we do that? We do that by ensuring that we're tackling two of the biggest cost burdens that low income and moderate income families have to deal with. And that is the cost of housing and the cost of transportation. And that is why we are so grateful, Mayor Darkin, to see your proposal include within it the desperately needed resources for affordable housing near transit in our city. We are thrilled to see you embrace a tool that we know most definitely works, and that is to fund the development of affordable housing near transit. To solve our housing crisis, we need to increase housing choices for people near amenities and near services, and that is near jobs, near transit, and near schools. We know for sure that with the growth that our city has experienced over the years, that has not been possible for far too many people. It is time that we make Seattle's growth work for housing. It is time that we make Seattle's growth work for people. It is time that Seattle's growth works to protect the environment and also ensure transit for all people. Let's build a community where we can all thrive. And with that, I will tend to introduce someone that I know has been doing that every day to make sure that it becomes a reality. Alex Hassan. My name is Alex Hudson, and I'm the Executive Director of Transportation Choices Coalition. We fight every day to bring more and better transit options to people across Washington State. I am proud to stand here today with Mayor Durkin, 
TNC drivers and housing and labor leaders and support this piece of legislation that will guarantee a livable wage for drivers and invest in critical housing and transportation improvements. As Seattle continues to grow at a rapid pace, our infrastructure has struggled to keep up. People in Seattle spend over 70 hours stuck in traffic every year, and Seattle is ranked seventh in the nation for congestion. This costs people money and robs them of time otherwise spent with their families and loved ones. This is compounded by the pursuit of affordable housing uh, for working people who are not often met when they can find housing with the transit and locking people into car-based commutes, exasperating our climate crisis and pushing further away people from where they wanna work and play. If we're going to be a city that prioritizes the health and well-being of our people and our planet, we need to move away from our reliance on cars and invest in better transportation options, more transit, more walking, and more biking options. Today, we're investing in a multimodal city. This funding allows Seattle to complete the Center City Connector streetcar that will link our two existing streetcar lines and carry more than 20,000 riders every single day, connecting some of our most densely populated neighborhoods with reliable transit. And we will use this to deliver other walk, bike, and transit projects that will make it easy and efficient for people across the city to get where they need to go. Our purpose is to build a brighter future for Seattle and steward us toward a city with abundant housing and transit and good paying jobs. Our actions today will make a positive impact on the health of our communities and environment for generations to come. Let's move this policy forward and ensure that everyone has access to opportunities to live a healthy life, a good job, stable affordable housing, and more bus, light rail, streetcar walking, and biking connections to opportunity and to each other. It's my honor to introduce Council President Bruce Harrell. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, someone have some paper, it look like I'll have some prepared remarks here. <laughs> I could bluff it here. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the process from here. And first of all, the mayor and her team and the community members and the advocates have done an outstanding job of hopefully making the city council's job a little easier because now the legislative, legislative process begins and that process begins with a listening session and a research session. But they have been listening and they've been doing their research and in my discussions with uh, TNC representatives, I've said, let's figure this out in Seattle as other states and, and legislative bodies throughout this country are trying to figure out what kind of scheme works. You know our needs. You heard them from Gloria. You heard them from Patience and Alex and Nicole. Housing, transit, sustainability, a livable city. So you know our needs. And so this is one of the tools we have. And again, the mayor and her team and the advocates have done an outstanding job of bringing something to the council. So from my analysis of it, it is solid. It's a good plan. But we will listen as we are required and we welcome the opportunity to do. We'll listen to other drivers. We'll listen to TNCs. We'll listen to other labor advocates and hopefully have a, uh, a, an outcome during our budget process that meets all the needs we hear today. I'd never heard Gloria's story before but it resonated um, and it's important for everyone to know the kinds of situations that good workers are going through uh, I've heard many stories over the years and that rates up there's um, one of the most impactful stories of what we're trying to solve so I want to thank the mayor and all of the advocates for bringing this package forward uh, I look forward to the process, so we're going to hit the ground running. We're not going to try to reinvent the wheel, but of course, it's been my experience of working on taxi issues and TNC issues that there's always a controversy. There's always someone that will feel left out of the equation, uh, left out of the process, so we'll bring them in and move forward. But I want to thank the mayor and all of her team and all of the advocates for bringing us a package that is strong, solid, bold and I look forward to moving forward. So I think at this point, we're gonna have some Q&A. Yep, sounds good. And we'll move forward. Thank you very much. Before we start the q and I also wanna give a special thanks to uh, President Harrell. As many of you know, he's in the last months 
of his term as city council and his commitment over the last many years to equity and justice in our city i think is unrivaled by anyone i've had the good fortune to work with and on this particular issue we literally stand on his shoulders um, because he has working been working these issues with drivers with tnc's with labor trying to get it right so i just want to thank you president harrell for all you've done on this any questions you say to uh, the drivers group that says this is going they have a study saying this will cost drivers 12 million a year in the first year so two things is one there is the component that ma there's three parts to this legislation the first is to mandate and make sure that every driver is paid a fair wage and fair and reasonable benefits I don't think there's any drivers who disagree that that's the right way to go. Um, and so I'm glad that we have consensus on that. I've read and heard the company say that they also agree that drivers deserve to be paid fairly. So we are starting from the same point on the most important part of this, that's economic justice. It's a very complicated area. That's why we're having this study so we can be transparent on how we get the number and make sure it reflects the economic reality of all drivers and the, uh, the companies will have input. The second is the tax and I will say to you, in this growing city of Seattle, a 50 cent tax is not regressive. And all economic modeling that I have seen shows it will have absolutely no impact on the number of rides that are taken in this city. And it should have absolutely no impact on the money going in any driver's pocket. Those companies can absorb that 50 cents and they should absorb that 50 cents. They have a very real impact on our public rights of way. Our public owns those streets and those curbsides. And every time a Uber or Lyft driver is trying to make their earning, when they pull over to a curb, them being there means somebody else can't be at that curb. And when they're in a bus lane or a bike lane, that means that there's other things impeded. So we have to deal with the very real impacts of traffic congestion. And we have to make sure that we have a dispute resolution center that can make sure that people aren't treated unfairly and have an independent place to go. And that 50 cents will help fund that too. So two quarters, nobody's gonna quit taking that ride. There are other drivers in town who are underpaid and incidentally create congestion. They're Amazon delivery drivers. Is there something in this that, sh that Amazon needs to be concerned about, that maybe the next round of going after gig economy workers and, and their, their Uber bosses is Amazon? So one thing that we have found in doing this uh, process is, while there is a large term that talks about the gig economy worker, and it is a growing part of our economy. Every sector of the gig economy is its own um, ecosystem and very complicated. And what works for one sector may not work for the other sectors. One reason this has taken so long for drivers to get fairness is because the economics of it are fairly complicated. What is, how do you make sure that a person is getting paid their minimum wage because it's not for every minute they're in their car. So we are going to make sure that we are focused on a sector where we know we have 36,000 drivers in this region, where we will have access to good data, both hopefully from the companies, from other cities who have regulated this, and from the drivers behind us and across the city, regardless of who those drivers are, and from their representation and labor. So we have to make sure we know we have in front of us and hopefully if we do what is a good job of this, it may be a model for other gig workers. But if you open your phone today, you can get someone to walk your dog, someone to pick up your dry cleaning. There is every kind of worker on an internet platform and those have to be regulated differently. So what we're tackling today is what we know we need to tackle is the TNC drivers. Mayor, does this replace any possible congestion tolling plan for the city? This is a separate thing from congestion tolling. Obviously, we know the 50 cents is not enough to reduce the number of rides, which is the whole theory behind congestion pricing. But I th what I think what it will do is give us some information on the volume of rides and how to collect certain things on either car by car or by fleet process. So this is not directly related to congestion pricing. Madam Mayor, a question on another important topic. Those DNA test kits that were accidentally destroyed 
What was your gut reaction when you first heard about that? And what do you say to the women who went through a very intrusive process to have those tests created and expected that they would help? Thank you for that question, Essex. I think that Chief Best and I both were very dismayed that this happened. Um, we are trying to ascertain what those DNA samples reflect. Um, we actually think they're the DNA samples taken from the offenders um, through cheek swabs. And there was a, a, uh, a glitch in the law that we collected those samples from offenders at the local level, but because of state law, the crime lab could not accept them. Pete Holmes worked for almost two years to get a law that they could, and during that period of time, unfortunately, those evidence was transferred from one place to another place, and after a study, uh, were destroyed. Chief Best did the absolute right thing. She contacted the Inspector General and said, I want you to investigate to make sure that this never happens again. So we think it's, it's really unfortunate that it happened. We're investigating to determine what those samples reflected in terms of the types of offenders. And we're also putting in place the, the procedures we have to have in place to make sure that doesn't happen again. What do you say to folks who hope more from, hope for more from police? Hope that those samples might lead to greater public safety, even if they didn't lead to a conviction in a particular attack. Right now, we're looking at what those, where those samples came from, because they, uh, and so there's no indication we have to date that any of those were would have led to reduction for a specific offender. But that's why we take them. You know, we know that the gathering of DNA evidence, while there's some controversy and privacy concerns, it also has a public safety component. So we're going to make sure that what happened never happens again. Um, and we put in the right policies and procedures that during this two-year leg period that there was this, this uh, failure to account for all the evidence. And I will tell you, every single day I know that the chief of police and every police officer go to work trying to keep this a safer city. Um, and they will continue to do that. I'm enormously grateful to the work that they do. And I want to tell the public that when we don't get it right, we're going to be honest about it and we're gonna to try to make sure we get it right the next time. Do you know what they were to do with those samples that ended up being destroyed? They, those samples are being held for a period of time because they go to the crime lab where they're tested and then they're kept in the CODA system, I think the CODA system, but whatever the equivalent is. Um, and they were waiting for a period of time and had to have a change in legislation in order for the crime lab to accept them. During that period of time, they were, yeah, and, and Council Member Harris wants to do that. During that period of time, they were transferred from the King County system to the Seattle Police Department system. There wasn't the right paperwork in place. Um, and for a series of circumstances that occurred, they were accidentally destroyed. Okay. President Harrell. I want to share with you a story that when I was 13 years old, I played basketball for this community center. And uh, I think I still hold the record for the most shots missed in a game. And the reason I tell you that story because that has absolutely nothing to do with why we're here. <laughs> and I'd like to sort of stick on the point of why we're here. So let's ask some questions about why we're here today. <laughs> I understand, but this is not appropriate Essex. I have a lot of concern, but I'm concerned about this moment at this time, about what we're trying to do for housing and homelessness and affordability and transit just at this particular moment, in all due respect, sir. So. Any more questions on today's announcement? One more. Yep. Can you say anything to riders who might have to absorb some of the cost of this tax? Yes, what I say to riders is when you get in that car, look in those drivers' eyes and tell them you will treat them fairly and justly and stand up for them. Yes. Thank you very much in Essex. We're happy to take questions later to the side.